Hey everyone, my name is Josh Williams. I am the community life pastor here at the Elm City Vineyard. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm really excited for us to continue this journey uh, on the 12 steps. I think one of the things that we're doing, if we're going to orient our kind of whole community to what's going on, uh, there's something that appears in a few movies. Um, I, don't even, I don't know if it's necessarily movies that I like, but it's just a common thing that happens in movies, uh, where there's a spotlight. Sometimes it's in a comedy, sometimes it's in a mystery, and the spotlight is chasing after like a person or even a group of people, and like it's trying to find the person, and the person's dodging the spotlight. Do you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes it's like really funny, and the person tries to like, dodge it for a while. Other times it's so serious, and you're just wondering, will my favorite hero get away? Um, but I think what we're doing is something like that. You might be confused. I think what we're doing is something like hearing and knowing this spotlight. I think the spotlight is God. One time, uh, sometimes when I uh, share about who God is, I talk to people about kind of like the spotlight of God, whether I'm talking to Yale students, um, whether I'm talking to people um, who are homeless. I, I talk about the spotlight. If God shone his spotlight on you, what would your reaction be? Like the light of God was like shining down on you and it was following you. What would you do? And I get different responses. Sometimes it's, I would run away. Sometimes it's, I would just like start praising God. Sometimes it's, I would just be confused. Like, why is there this light shining on me? It's kind of strange. I think my response is always kind of being paralyzed for a second, maybe crumbling down, and then rising up slowly. I think there's something about the transformative power of God and the ability to be transformed that's just an intense topic. The fact that God changes us, that God intervenes, uh, that God is working in our lives. I think to start there is to start with an intense premise, that God's involved in our world, that his light is active and available, and it actually is shining on each of us. And the question is, what do we do with that? Do we run? Do we stay? Do we engage? I think when we look at these 12 steps, we have to think of these as 12 steps of engagement with God, 12 steps of being with God, because his light, I think, is on our community. Um, it's on us. So we have an opportunity to respond to that. And I hope today um, we take that uh, invitation to respond. As Matt talked about earlier, we are going through 12 steps uh, to transformation. I'm just going to flip through some of the steps right now. We're on step four and five, which I'll be talking about. But transformation is something that I think we all know um, is relevant to us. It's all um, relevant to us in our lives. And most of us know that when we're honest, uh, we want transformation. We need transformation. There's things about our character that we want changed. There's flaws that we have, ways that we hurt others, things that are left undone. And we want to see progress. We want to see uh, that change over time. And the past few weeks, I think we've talked about transformation in a few very crucial ways, and I want to start with that before moving on. The transformation process, first of all, is not self-help. We're not simply helping ourselves by doing this, but as Matt uh, said earlier, we're making room for God to have his way in us. We're making ourselves available. And this process is meant to build trust in us, that God does want to transform us, that he does have the power to do that work. And then over time, we'll actually be able to see tangible fruit. Like, our lives will actually be different. Like, we'll see change. That's an amazing thing. We don't just think this is self-help or something that we're just doing and not expecting something to change. So, not trying harder. Uh, the transformation process is also not self-pity. Though we are talking about sins, we're talking about wrongs we've committed, um, flaws we have, we don't need to beat ourselves up over this. There's something freeing about admitting that we've been under the power of sin, a force in the world that keeps us sluggish towards the things of God. It's not that we're damaged beyond repair. We simply have gone the wrong way, and we need to find something, someone, to turn us around. And the transformation process is not just about ourselves. This one's a little bit interesting. If I'm going to be transformed, how is that not just about me? So I don't know if any of you have been doing this. I totally admit that I'm guilty of this. But if you've taken a Zimbio or BuzzFeed quiz, do you know what I'm talking about? It's a quiz about kind of which character you are in something or your favorite uh, 
Uh, what would your favorite Jane Austen novel be, or who would your character be? Uh, what part of the nation are you? So we're going to do something here. If you've taken one of those quizzes, just raise your hand. OK, so it's a good, good amount of people. OK, good to get some honesty here. Um, so I love those quizzes. It annoys my wife a little bit. I was like, Tina, I'm Nick Fury. Tina, I'm this. And she's like, I just don't care right now. Um, it, it's hard to see these quizzes as anything more than introspection, uh, curiosity, and then, of course, the Facebook blast announcing to the whole world that you're this character or that you're Pride and Prejudice and not that other novel. Um, transformation is, I think, very, very different. Um, it will involve us. It will involve our lives. But it will also involve other people as we examine ourselves. Um, and it also needs to include the world of others and, in fact, the actual world um, as we think about individuals, whole groups of people, even certain spaces that we need to transform and that will be transformed as we are being transformed. And lastly, our transformation hopefully never bears fruit just for ourselves, just for our own lives. But I think as we go through this, uh, hopefully it will help us love our neighborhoods better, our coworkers better, our dorm better. A process like this should affect our surrounding communities in a profound way. This transformation process is a journey, seeking God's best for our lives, knowing that will shake up our lives and affect the communities around us. And I think we have to seize this opportunity. We actually have to like, take it. I think we really do. Otherwise, I think it might just pass us by. We have the Sunday series. We have these amazing Lent guides. They're up here if you need one a little bit later. Um, but I think it's still easy to get overwhelmed or to lose focus. Just when we do things, anything, it doesn't matter if it's um, about spirituality or God, I just think it's uh, easy for us to just lose interest over time. And I think we need to stay engaged. We need to seize this opportunity and really trust that we can be transformed in these few weeks. And I want to remind you of the previous steps that we've taken together on this journey. We admitted that we were powerless over sin, that our lives had become unmanageable. We came to believe a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And we made a decision to turn our will and our lives to the care of God as we understood him. As I turn the corner to start talking about steps four and five, I hope we all ask God for what it will take for us to implement some of these steps. What we'll need to do that, whether it's attention, courage, hope, I trust he'll give us those things as we ask him. So before we move on, I want to pray for us. Father, I thank you that you are the giver of every good thing. I thank you that you desire and fight for our transformation, our wholeness, our completeness. I thank you, God, that the way each of us here is gathered in this room, each of us here um, is currently, God. I thank you that you have plans and purposes. You have ways you want to stretch us to grow us, ways you want us to look more like you. God, I pray wherever we are with you that we would receive a blessing of encouragement in the process of becoming like you, of being transformed, of seeing our character changed and therefore our communities changed. God, would you give us what we need to engage today? In the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, a proverb that I think can anchor us for this whole journey um, is one from Proverbs 28, 13. No one who conceals transgressions will prosper, but one who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Sometimes when we read scripture, we get a glimpse into an otherworldly life, a life that we don't know, a life that's very different. The rules are different, things are upside down, and we're told to live completely countercultural to the norms of this world. This proverb for me is one of those glimpses. Um, when I think about people who prosper, um, people who are successful, people who are kind of in the spotlight, I can think of many people who have concealed transgressions. Uh, I wonder if you can think of those people too. We're in an age whether um, 
most, where most media fi figures, uh, whether it's world leaders, actors, um, have scandals, probably at least once a career, sometimes you know, once every few years. And the pattern is pretty similar. Kind of keep going, life as usual, then all of a sudden there's a news leak and th something kind of bubbles up. Obviously, it's wrong and it's not true, so you deny it and you keep denying it until it's obvious that it is true and then you admit it, usually with the press conference. Uh, and then you ride that wave up and down, up and down, up and down, until we just forget. Probably because there's another scandal, something else has gone on. Uh, we're just focused elsewhere. And then you kind of go back to prominence. That's the way, maybe that's a new thing. But I just find so many times people just go back to the way things are. Um, obviously with a little new entry to their Wikipedia page. But that's maybe the only thing that's different. Um, it's a crazy cycle. And maybe the only thing that's crazier is that we're so used to it as a culture now. Um, how, do we sink, how do we make sense of this kind of prosperity, this kind of maintaining success in light of concealed transgressions, even if they're concealed transgressions that make their way into the light? I think a large part of the way our culture has made it has been through being jaded. That's one of, I think, the consequences. We don't trust authority. We see good things as having expiration dates, so it can be good, but only for this long. And we don't have much hope for true transformation. There's always a potential scandal. There's always potential burnout. There's always a potential fa failure looming over others and even ourselves. And as a coping mechanism, we cling to a kind of authenticity that says, hey, I'm broken. <laughs> it's a message that says, here I am. This is all I can be. Here are my flaws deal with it. That way you know what you're getting into. You won't be disappointed if I tell you up front that this is who I am, that these are my choices. This isn't us concealing transgressions necessarily, but it's more uh, making them who we are. Practically, this could look like embracing a temper that you know is a little too wild, letting your calm personality lead you to being silenced or slothful, or accepting lust and envy is just a part of our lives. There's a way that we're just kind of saying, this is just who we are now. Where our culture conceals wrongs or identifies with transgressions, this proverb suggests something completely different, that we bring them to the light, that we confess them, that we forsake them. It's active. It's not just a passive thing, but it's an active thing. I think this is a glimpse into a different kind of world, just a completely different place. And I think steps, two, steps four and five are the same thing, very different. And here's what they are. Step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Searching and fearless. We admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Steps four and five. I feel like there's been like a jump up a little bit. I mean, not that the other ones were easy, but there seems to be like, wait, this is actually requiring a lot of activity for me now. The, the other one's kind of like, okay, this is going on. This is how I understand life to be. This is kind of a setting and an environment. And now I'm required to like do all these different tasks and different things like that. It's, it's requiring activity. It's requiring something of me. So it's interesting. It's interesting steps. And I'm not sure if you remember uh, the keywords section from, like, voca or from elementary school, like textbooks, remember that? Where they would bold words and then later on they'd say, like, remember these key words. For me, after reading those, I uh, remember three. Searching, fearless, and exact. Interesting word choice, eh? <laughs> Thanks for that. And then there's another one. Another human being. So not just searching, not just fearless, not just exact for yourself, but oh yeah, you've got to tell someone else, another human being, just in case you were going to tell your dog or something like that. It's not the dog, it's got to be someone else. Um, and I think the proverb we read earlier and these steps, if practiced, will give us a whole new way of life. I completely believe that. I just think it's going to make our lives different. I think what we're after is a transparent life. Transparent living, it gives us the courage to be ourselves while being transformed. Where sometimes our culture values authenticity, um, I think we can still have it, but it's as we're being transformed. We get to be who we are, we get to be ourselves, but it's as someone is calling us forward. 
And also, transparent living encourages wonder and gratefulness at the generosity of God. That God, in his love for us, allows us to change, but loves us every step of the way. So reflecting on these things, there's a few questions. How do we do this? And, and why? Why are we doing this? I think the proverb already started to answer the why. When we're transparent, we obtain God's mercy, his kindness applied to our particular life situation. I, re I really like that, that we actually like get God's mercy, not just as like this thing that is called God's mercy, but I think it looks like something in our real lives. Like what would God's kindness, God's mercy look like if you obtained it for your actual life? Not that you just get like a plus one, like some video game, but like what would it really mean in your life? To me, that's a very provocative question. And if we share, if we confess, if we forsake our transgressions, it says that we obtain that kind of mercy, God's kindness applied to our life situation. I think there's another really good reason to, another really good reason to share, to confess. God already knows our lives. He already sees us. Living transparently is also just simply living sincerely with a God who is deeply with us. If we're going to believe that God um, can transform us, I think it's also probably a safe assumption that he, he knows who we are. So why would we hide something from him? He's right there. In the Psalms, David, an ancient biblical king, uh, and one who got caught in his own scandal too, you can read that in the Lent Guide, he recounts God's closeness like this. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. That's amazing. It's so amazing, right? Sorry, just got caught up. In the first part of the passage, we see God as someone who knows us in an incredibly, incredibly detailed way. Anywhere we go, there he is. Any move we make, he's right there. And if we don't know about God's character, even though the, you know, David seems pretty excited about this, if we don't know about God's character, it's almost a little bit creepy, right? That God's like just always there watching you. He's behind your pew. It's not just the connection card. It's God, too. Um, why does God seem to be stalking all of us? But towards the end, there's something different happening. We learn more of who God is, not just someone that follows us, but someone that has created us, someone that's made us, someone who's formed us delicately, thoughtfully, with care. This is who God is. Knowing that we are made in the image of God and that our maker is invested in us is a source of confidence for our transformation. 
Why would God, who's with us, who's made us, leave us, hurt, abandoned, wounded? Not only does God know our every thought, he knows the ones that are aligned with the God-given purposes he has for us. And he knows the others that are just blown away like sand. He knows that, and he's still not going anywhere. He's still with us. God's decided to be with us. Heaven or the depths, the brightest light or the darkest night, our acceptance towards him or our indifference, God still hems us in, still discerns our thoughts, and is with us always. The awareness of God's presence and his thoughts for me have helped me countless times in my life. Mostly it's helped me not to feel alone. It's helped me to feel known in times of confusion and hurt. And it's helped me to start to process real brokenness inside of me, especially when I just don't know how to do that, when I'm overwhelmed. Uh, At a past ECV leadership retreat that we had, uh, we went through an inventory, an inventory of emotional health created by a pastor named Pete Scazzaro, who leads a church in New York City. This inventory was a really great resource. I remember I went with Tina, and we decided to, we tried to do this not with the Zimbio BuzzFeed quizzes, because Tina's not a part of that, but with other more serious, proper quizzes, Tina graces me with not only her presence, but her feedback. So we do uh, the quiz, and we'll like, kind of test each other, like, really, are you mostly that, not that? So it's helpful. Uh, we try to keep each other honest. And so we did that together, Uh, for this uh, leadership retreat for the uh, Emotionally Healthy Inventory. And it was a very interesting survey. Uh, There was a lot of things that were revealed about me, about Tina, about both of us. Um, This isn't going to be all about that. Just one part. And just me, because I'm the one speaking. Um, Not not Tina, right? I wouldn't do that. Um, And one of the things that came up was a weakness uh, in my life, something that um, I struggled with that kind of showed up during the inventory about processing conflict processing um, kind of healthy conflict and doing that in an active way instead of a passive way. Uh, It was not a complete surprise to me, but I quickly grew anxious because I was like, wait, it's a result, it's here, I know it now. It's like a number on something that makes it more real. And I wondered how was I going to grow and obey God on this front. This was not just a sin that involved me. It wasn't one that I could just somehow... Um, try to try harder at myself, but it actually required movement, required obedience. And like most sin, it was messy, and it required me to step into messy relationships and call out sin, my own, and the sin of others. The lo- and again, like sin, uh, the longer the conflict had persisted, uh, the messier this process was. So when you don't do things, when you're not obedient, it gets harder. And that's what happened. <laughs> um, so to obey God, I had to step into that. And on my own, I didn't want to go there. Just wasn't interested in it, didn't want to do it. Um, but I realized something. Um, I could manage. I could try to be peaceable. I think probably not using peace in the right way, but still think, okay, I'm trying to be peaceable. Um, I could not get into too much trouble through doing that. That didn't look like an option anymore, though. What it looked like was sin. It was sin. And God knowing me helped calm me, helped reassure me that he knows me, even in my reluctance to obey, to move out on something that he's asked me to do. And he gave me the grace to overcome that anxiety, to overcome that nervousness, to see it in perspective of something God was doing in my life that actually was a gift something God was doing in my life that was, even though something that I had still been struggling with um, in the past, there was something about knowing that right then. I really like this when thinking about sin. There's something about being aware of sin that we're committing in the moment where God has a present promise for how he wants to transform us. Even if we've been struggling it, if we're aware of it, there's something God wants to do in this season with the people involved like right now. And he gave me the grace to understand that, to see that perspective. And I realized I didn't have to start alone. I also didn't have to start with the people that I was having conflict with. This might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but I didn't have to start there. Um, I had the privilege of starting with God and working towards a place where I could finally address sin in some really important relationships. 
a process that's now an ongoing thing as I see how God didn't want it just to be a one-time thing, and that was kind of my faulty way of looking at it, but he wanted it to be a lifestyle. And I've even seen some fruit as God has led me on that path. I've been able to become more myself through this process, more who I actually am, more who God's made me to be. I have also grown in thanksgiving for God's kindness to me during this, how he's seen me, how he knows me, how it wasn't the worst thing ever, so awful, but actually it was good. And I saw how God was leading me towards that each step of the way. So once again, the steps this week are very, very clear, maybe scarily clear for some of us. But it's not enough to know them, or even why we ought to do them. We need to know how to do them in the first place, and then practice them in our lives. Once again, steps. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. We admit it to God, to ourselves, and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. So what we're going to do now is think about some guiding principles for how to do this, and then actually I'm going to suggest a few ways we could go about this. Um, So as we create, as all of us create, a searching, fearless, moral inventory of ourselves. I think we need to remember one thing. This is like pretty crucial to me because I was really, when I saw the language, I was like, that's really intense. So I need to think about it. And I think this thought is helpful. At least it was helpful for me. Um, we need to remember that uh, a life following Jesus means anchoring our life on his life, including his morality, not our own life or morality. So we're not making this inventory to become perfect um, through our own morality. And thankfully, our own morality isn't the final say. Like, thank God, it's not. Um, We actually still get to depend on Jesus and what he's done in his life. Uh, This is simply, again, making ourselves available to God. Our anchor is still Jesus, not what our inventory will say or not say. And here's just some uh, ways that we can help think, I think that help help us think about uh, what this inventory could look like how we can start to process it. I think one way is through Scripture, through looking at Scripture. um, And remember what I said earlier, that it kind of is this otherworldly place. When we read Scripture, oftentimes we get a glimpse into an otherworldly life. I think Scripture can do this uh, for us here, and it can help us. Whether it's looking at Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, whether it's looking through the Ten Commandments, Paul's exhortations to young churches, all will provide us a picture of God's best. And that will convict us. It will call us forward. We'll see how things are meant to be. We'll see beauty. We'll see a life that we might not be living. And we'll see God call us forward. We also want to include other people on this journey. Uh, One, so we uh, have our blind spots covered, the ways that we don't see our own sin. We don't see the things that we do that damage others. But also, so people can actually encourage us can be uh, ways that we see God's grace so we don't fall into being too hard on ourselves or into condemning ourselves. Labels or lies that we could give ourselves that actually slow down transformation. Having people is helpful on this journey. And lastly, I'd encourage us to sit with ourselves. What does that look like? What does that mean? I think it means simply being quiet for a while, maybe an extended period of time that would make us uncomfortable. What comes up when we do that, even if it's just our inability to quiet out internal thoughts, is a stunning benchmark of what preoccupies our mind and busies our soul. Just simply being still or trying to be still, we often see things come up in ourselves. So I think all those things would just be helpful things to think about or do if you're thinking, you know, what could this look like? What could this Uh, What could these things be, or how do I be uh, search, how do I be fearless and searching? I think those are some some ways to start. And here's a few models uh, for how to go about this. Um, Not all will be for you, so don't freak out. You don't have to do all of them, but these are just some ways that we can orient um, to thinking about how could I actually do something that would actually be a comprehensive view of my life? Because I think that's what they're asking about, to have a comprehensive view of what our lives are. Uh, here are some helpful models. Uh, the first is the emotionally healthy uh, inventory. There's a few copies in the back, um, so you can grab uh, a few sheets of paper. I think it's like four pages. Um, 
And there's also a website where you can find the same inventory. And they have a little thing where you can just mark a uh, different, I think it's, is this very true, somewhat true, that sort of thing. You can just mark it, score it up, and then you'll see uh, a result for you. Again, process that with people. Just don't take that as gospel truth, but it's in the back. I think that's a really helpful one. It's been helpful for me and helpful for some other people in our church. Um, the second one I thought could be helpful is uh, actually looking at your schedule. You can look at your schedule and examine your daily, weekly, monthly schedule. As you do that, you can notice times in your day where you kind of sense a struggle, uh, maybe places or areas where you notice a destructive pattern in your life, whether it's a certain place you go to, a certain activity you're doing, maybe where bad decisions are made, whether that's a time when you're interacting with family, uh, a time where you're interacting with friends. And in addition to looking at what appears on your schedule, to think about what's not appearing on your schedule. Don't just think about things that you're doing, but also things that you're not doing. So if you keep a schedule, take it out, look at it. And if you don't, then you can just create one, whether it's a, a daily, uh, a weekly, or a monthly one. You can even do more than that if you'd like. Uh, third one, this is actually one of the ones that came to mind first. I think it's a, I think an intense thing to do, but I think it could be really helpful. It's looking at power relations in your life um, and where there's power in your life. One of the reasons why I wanted to do this is because I think sometimes we interact with people differently and we kind of commit different wrongs depending on how secure we feel, how much power we have in a situation, how much authority we have, or how little authority or how little power we have. Um, so here's some questions I uh, just want to throw out uh, to get our head around this uh, model, this way of thinking. How do you treat those who have power over you? Maybe it's a boss, maybe it's a family member, how do you treat those that you share power with? A co-leader, a spouse, a partner. How do you treat those that you have power over? A subordinate in an organization, a child. And lastly, how do you treat people you feel have no power? You, you might not say that, but when you just think about it, oh, this person I don't feel like has power in my life at least. How do you treat those kind of people? And I advise you to go through this twice. Once with people in your life, people you actually know, and then more with, the second time, more with groups of people or even spaces, um, places in New Haven, places uh, where you work, where you go to school. Think about ways that you are interacting based on power. And the last one, um, it's more, I guess, of a classic way of doing this, but I still think it might be helpful for our community, is just think about what is taboo, taboo topics um, that probably shouldn't be taboo, but are. Um, thinking about how are we processing money greed, sex, uh, these kind of big picture taboos that uh, we often don't talk about, not just as a church, but um, uh, just as people. But also there's other things too, um, taboos that uh, maybe aren't as scandalous, but have become more normalized, things like gossip, complaint, cynicism, things that we don't want to say are sin, because if we do, it's like, dang it, this is happening all the time. Um, sometimes we look over these things, but it's just more complicated to think about what does it look like to be freed? What does it look to be, uh, to be pursuing God's best? And it actually helps us bring these things into the light. And again, you don't have to do all of those, but I just think those are some helpful models. So maybe think about what's one, what's one you want to commit to processing as you create a searching and fearless moral inventory of yourself. I think it'll be good. Uh, the other thing to do is to think about how to examine ECV like this. Um, as a church, we obviously um, have flaws. We are pretty awesome, but we obviously have flaws too. Um, and using one of these models will be just as helpful uh, for us as it will be um, individually. So think about ECV and how it too can be transformed. And lastly, I just want to say uh, one other word, and this is always something I feel like is important, is we want to be people who share with others. This is step five, talk to another human being. Um, but it's easy for me to be up here um, as a pastor, as someone who's speaking, saying, yeah, just share with other people. You know, just find someone. Um, not going to make you do it now. Turn in your pews. I'm not going to do that. Um, but it's, it's easy for me to say that, but it's a hard process. I just want to encourage you to pray, um, to pray to find relationships, to find people uh, where you can share honestly. Um, I find that God quickly responds to these kinds of prayers. Usually in my life, it's been 
Tina doing something like this, like finding someone or finding a group of people. I was like, this is amazing. This is so great. Like, I don't have this. And then I pray. Like, I'm like, God, can you give me someone or a group of people? And then God usually does that. Um, it takes a little bit longer, but it's good. Um, and whether it's having, um, whether it's wondering if you have these sorts of friends, whether it's having a different, difficult schedule, I just think it's important to process with another human being, to share with someone in the flesh about how we're doing, to take time with God and process ourselves too. This helps cement the process and make it a living one, not just a static thing that we do one time. Living transparently in this way will feel weird and strange and maybe otherworldly, but I think that might be the point. It will also change us. And I want to end with a prayer, um, a prayer that David wrote um, after making his own mistakes, again, with his scandal that you can read about in the Lent Guide. It's not Us Weekly, but it's our Lent Guide. And I want to end with this prayer because our work is not over when we create a list of moral failures. Uh, in fact, if we stop there, I'm not sure exactly what that will do. But we want to obtain mercy. Again, God's kindness applied to our particular life situation. In David's case, this is exactly what he did. He did so boldly, not even really knowing what God's response would be. But I think he felt compelled to be sincere before God who already knew his faults. Here is his prayer. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you were justified in your sentence and blameless when you passed judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. I think that can be our prayer for today. So as we wrap up, here are a few questions. Where do you need to obtain mercy from God? What's that particular situation in your life where you want to see God apply mercy? What are obstacles preventing you from living a transparent life? And I want to say here, I think some of these um, where you're starting are actually can be really legitimate. It can be really hard to be transparent. Um, so take that seriously. How do you feel about God's knowledge of your life and his presence with you? Do you believe that he is with you? Do you want him to be with you? And what's one way you want to create a searching and fearless moral inventory? Think, uh, thinking about these questions, reflecting on them, will help us as a community seek God's transformation. They'll help us um, be with him, uh, because I think God does want this transformation for us. I'm going to pray for us, and we'll transition to uh, a time of a prayer of confession and then a time of communion. God, I thank you that you're here with us, that your presence is here, and I pray that you would help us realize that and know that as a community and individually. I pray this in Jesus' name.